And if you have it. This time I'd like to introduce Kirk Hayes, our chair of the Regional Tourism Board. Well, thanks everybody for coming today. Uh, thank you, Ray. I believe we are gonna have a short video from the mayor, I believe, which is gonna run first for the program. Are we ready for that? Well, why don't we get start, stay on time. Thank you, Mayor. <laughs> I'm sure he was telling us how much he appreciates Ray and, and others. So, uh, Welcome, everyone, to the 2021 Tulsa Regional Tourism Annual Meeting. I'm Kirk Hayes. I'm the current chair of the Tulsa Regional Tourism Group and president and CEO of Arvest Bank here in Tulsa. I'd like to start off by thanking Circle Cinema for hosting this evening. Please give them a round of applause. We really appreciate that. This space allows us to safely meet in person and virtually, so I understand we have a lot of people virtually here today as well, uh, to celebrate together the great success that the Tulsa tourism community has seen this year. And we are so excited to welcome all you guests here today. Even though you didn't socially distance, a lot of you are sitting by each other, this space allows us that opportunity to do that. For the last decade, I've uh, personally taken a lot, a lot of personal interest in supporting the mission of Tulsa Regional Tourism. And Arvest Bank uh, has been a momentum investor like, like many of you have. The work Tulsa Regional Tourism has done for our community has made a lasting impact on our wonderful city and is made possible by the resilient Tulsa tourism community and all those that support it. We want to first thank and recognize all those in attendance, elected officials, investors, chamber leadership, my fellow executive board members, tourism advisory board members, and all the amazing attractions, hoteliers, event and conference leaders, and venue operators that are here as well. We thank you for being present and appreciate, genuinely appreciate all that you do for the city of Tulsa. Tonight, we are gonna celebrate the work of Tulsa Regional Tourism, which includes the Tulsa Convention and Visitors Bureau, the Tulsa Sports Commission, and the Tulsa Office of Film, Music, Arts, and Culture, Culture Tulsa FMAC. And what a great year they had, by the way. I'm sure we'll hear a little bit about that. Let's give another round of applause for the entire Tulsa Regional Tourism team who are determined to work every day to promote our fine city here in Tulsa. It's been another unprecedented year and we are thankful to be here again tonight as a result of the stead steadfast support from our community partners. We'd like to thank all of our momentum investors and sponsors and there's a lot of them and a lot of them are here tonight. We want to thank them and their continued financial support and advocacy during these difficult times we've been going through. Those investments, as you probably guess, have been the lifeline of getting this organization through this pandemic. And, we, and for that, we are very grateful for all the investors that are here in attendance tonight. The Tulsa Regional Tourism Team partners every year with Oxford Economics to produce the Tulsa Tourism Economic Study. We are an organization that relies heavily on data and works 
very closely with the data that's presented us. Oxford Economics is the leading firm in global forecasting and quantitative analysis. So, despite the fact that it's on the back of the handout that you gave, let's talk about some of the numbers real quick. I think you'll get a kick out of this. 2021 study found that there were 7.2 million visitors that came to the city of Tulsa. They spent $845 million in our city. Think about that for a minute. 7.2 million visitors. That's like the entire population of the state of Arizona coming to Tulsa for one day. Think about that. Entire state of Arizona. They spent $845 million in our city. That's $2.3 million every single day that's being spent here from those visitors. I want you to think about that a little bit. Tourism accounts for 11,000 jobs in our community. That's about 3.4% of all the jobs we have here supported by tourism. State and local income tax or taxes that are paid, $69 million are paid by that. That assists all of us with about $420 a year in taxes for every household in the city of Tulsa. So you're getting a feel for how important this is. We look at tourism a bit like a business. And I know I'm a banker, but we look at tourism, I look at tourism like a business. If we had a business in this community, it was thinking about leaving, as we often do. I'm leaving to Tulsa, taking my business to Tulsa. We would rally the troops. We would go there. We would do everything within our power to protect that, uh, that asset that the city had and try to keep that business from, from leaving our city, as we should. So do you want this to slip away? Uh, do you want this tourism piece to slip away in our city? Who is going to spend that $2.3 million every single day if those people leave our community? Uh, how do we replace 7.2 million visitors a year if this slips away? Who fills their bed in the hotel room? And who fills their seat in the restaurant? I hope you're gathering this as to how important this is. Do you, do you want to keep it? You know, those 11,000 jobs and $669 million in taxes that they pay. Or do you want it to grow? You want to invest in something to make it grow. The hotel tax, the private investors, the sponsorships, that's what keeps this machine going. Knowing that every dollar that is spent brings more to our Tulsa community and supporting all of the entertainment that we all get to enjoy and participate in. So the city of Tulsa is fortunate to have this Tulsa Regional Tourism Team and all those associated with it. In the weeks and months ahead, you will probably, you will no, no doubt hear about more events that just got brought to the city of Tulsa. More projects being filmed here from FMAC. Uh, that's exciting to hear. I hope you understand where this is coming from. This is coming from a very energetic and dedicated team that's committed to promoting Tulsa every day. Yeah, thank you very much, thank you very much. We all benefit from this, folks. We all benefit from it. And we don't want it to slip away. We don't want it to stay constant. We want to grow it. Uh, we appreciate the momentum investors. We appreciate everything that's done in this community to support this organization. And I can promise you as chair that this group works very hard to bring all of these things to our city. We've got the assets. If you remember years ago, we have the assets in this city to bring a lot of folks here and to entertain them. And the numbers just keep growing. Uh, so I'm really proud. If you didn't know, I'm really proud to be associated with this group and the work that they've done. It's very exciting to hear some of the work that they've doing. So congratulations to Ray Hoyt and the entire Tulsa Regional tourism team on being innovative and persevering uh, during 2020, whatever we want to call that year, and the front end of 2021. Things are getting better. Things are improving. And pay attention to what this group does. And every time you hear about this event or this new movie star that's in Tulsa uh, filming a new project, I mean, think about where it comes from. Think about the momentum investors, the hotel tax the newly initiated TID, all these dollars that flow into this organization. Fralka handles the finances of this organization now. I know she does an outstanding job. It's fun to be a part of it. If you get a chance to be a part of it, volunteer to be a part of this group. 
It's fun. It's exciting. It's improving Tulsa every day. It's making this place a blast to be in. So thank you for allowing me a few minutes to talk about, about how proud I am of this. And with that, I'd like to introduce Ray Hoyt. Good evening, everybody. Um, if you can't tell, he's pretty excited about being our chair. Um, but it's always fun to work with Kirk and our board members. It's funny, we always share inside baseball, as we call it. And Kirk, tonight before we started, said, hey, can I share that? And I'm like, no, it's, it's embargoed. He's like, all right, can I share this? I'm like, no, we're, it's, it's going to be released in a couple of weeks. He's like, how about this? And what's crazy is, is we have so many things in front of us that we're going to announce in the next 60 days. I think are going to like shake people up. And we're doing it with 35% less staff. Um, and we're doing it with less money, less resources. But uh, the team that we have here today um, just doesn't have quit in them. Um, they, just, they just don't know what it is not to win, not to succeed. And uh, I can't say enough about them. Um, thank you, Mayor. Well, I'm sure we'll figure out his clip, and we'd love to show that. Um, because it's important, because the, the mayor and the city is one of our biggest investors, along with everybody else that uh, Kirk mentioned. Um, I, again, I can't say enough about my staff. When this kind of last 18 months started, uh, nobody turned tail and ran. Nobody quit. Um, our, our mantra was, mother is the, um, or crisis is the mother of innovation. And we started figuring out how to do the things we do. How do we do 81 events in, in a pandemic? How do we do 41 films in a pandemic? We did. Um, and we figured out how to do it. Um, and we never said no to our clients. We just said, you can come, but only if you're safe. Um, you can participate in our community, but only at our rules and our guidelines. And all of them agreed to that, and they came to Tulsa. Um, the national average of lost business was 39%, and we were under that by two points. So we, we succeeded the national average and hang, hung on to our market. Um, and it's been great to work with the staff. If you don't know them, if they haven't introduced yourselves, uh, please seek them out, thank them. Um, they work tirelessly. Um, and uh, there's days I push them probably too hard. Um, but they've learned how to tell me not no, but not now. And I appreciate that from them every day. Um, some cool things to announce today to talk about. Um, like we said before, we have an organization that relies on data. Um, data uh, is the language of any business today. Uh, used to be, and Reggie probably knows this, there was a day when you could throw out uh, a bat and ball or something and tell them it was sports and people would give you money. Well, today that's not the case. Tourism, sports, film, and music is a business. And people rely on data and we rely on facts to convince our investors, many of you are here, and we convince the city and other people to donate or to give us that money so that we can invest in the community to draw and create business opportunities in our community. But without data, we don't have a story to tell. So if we've worked through this past year, um, over several years with Patty Crosser on our team, she's right down there. Patty, raise up your hand. Um, we would not be where we are today without her. Um, she's somebody, she's the epitome of an intern who worked her way into our staff, who worked her way into a manager, and now she is a director of, now I'm gonna make sure I read this right because I always screwed up, data science um, or extraordinaire is what we call her, but she is the director of research and data strategy and continues to propel our organization forward with her efforts. She helps us forecast business opportunities, ROI, return on investment, economic investment, so that every penny we spend on an event, we know the value of that investment is giving back to the community through business um, initiatives, com, um, taxes, um, spending, exercise. And now we can look at businesses and events and clients and say it doesn't fit or it's not a good fit for us. And she's key to that strategy and helping us guide through um, some 200 events we do every year and making sure we make the right investment. Uh, then many of you know we, uh, Marlene Livaday. Marlene, where are you at? Raise your hand if you can't see Marlene back there. We transitioned Marlene from the sales team and leading, yeah, go Marlene, um, leading our sponsor Tulsa campaign. She's made it possible for us to better organize industry support and sponsorships, further uniting our community and moving us forward as we secure even more events and national recognition. She really is, um, kind of chasing all of these loose ends. We have a lot of people who want to commit 
um, and continue to commit to organization. And she's really just rounding all that up and really creating more relationships in the community. We have 82 investors right now. We'd like to make that 182. So, um, you know, Marlene's that person for us. Um, and she works with me daily, and we try and obviously generate more activity and more investment opportunities for you in the community to do so. Also on our team, um, uh, we had two new additions this year, and I call them, you know, they're kind of like our pandemic uh, staff. You know, they, we had some staff come here, Ashley and Joel, who spent very few days or weeks in the office before the pandemic broke out, and they literally had to learn our culture and our team through video screen. Um, and they've done amazing. They are amazing staff. But again, here we were in the middle of this. Yeah, thank you. And they, they moved from here, from here from someplace else. So talk about a, a double-edged sword, right? They don't know anybody. They've got a job to do, a new job to do, and they've moved their families to a new city. And they've hit it out of the park. They've exceeded every goal, every expectation that I had of them, and they are amazing people. Um, and we, we benefit from their expertise um, and their experience every day. But also, um, we had two, two additions to this team. Lauren Rogers, who's down here, who is running our tech and is in our Marcom team. And uh, I know right now she's sitting down there like, I can't believe this is happening. But you know what? Um, uh, everybody, uh, you know, things don't go the way we plan sometimes. And we, we just overcome and we innovate. And I'm sure she, she'll figure that out. But again, she's been a great asset to our team. Um, and then Bree Mullen, who joined the FMAC team. Bree, where are you at out there? Um, she joined our team as well. Um, Lauren has helped us keep our ship afloat while we search for a new VP of Marcom, and we did hire somebody. He'll be joining our team on Tuesday. His name is Tim Chambers, and we're excited about that. Um, and Bree has been tremendous for us driving the uh, expansion of the FMAC program, like Tulsa Creativity Database, which is where you can go and put your um, film location sites and different things in there as well, so we can forward that to film producers and makers. And the Tulsa FMAC dot com features so she's been a great add to our team and we want to welcome both of them to our team and um, our members thank you we also want to highlight the industry recovery efforts continued by our team throughout this interesting moment in time and it's just a moment in time we'll we'll look back at this time and we'll realize that things change but probably for the better and some things change that probably needed to change and i think that's how we all look at it is it's not that business um, isn't good, it's just changed, and we're still succeeding. Um, we're grateful for the Tulsa County Commissioners. I know Karen's here. Karen, thank you so much. Couldn't have done it without you. Um, for their support in the, the County Cares Act Recovery Program and the Tulsa Sales Recovery Program. Do we have a video, Lauren? Let's show that video. This went really well on the test. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Please be patient. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and let her catch up. So the Tulsa Safely program that was funded by CARES programs by tourism recovery effort was awarded $565,000 in CARES funding from the county commissioners. With more than 200 businesses signed up, and this was our way to communicate to the visitors. Like if you're coming, we want you to come to our community, but safely. And our community wanted that as well, right? They did not not want visitors, but they also wanted them uh, to come safely. So um, Tulsa Safely was a resounding success. Our community um, it elevated our city's brand during a time when many locals and tourists were hesitant to venture out. With the guidelines of the Tulsa Health Department and the CDC, the campaign united businesses, restaurants, and attractions behind the safety measures to uh, mitigate the spread of COVID-19 and attract visitor spending. Again, many of our peers, many of my peers were just closed and, and we, um, decided that wasn't gonna be the case and that we're gonna survive this. And the way to do that was to innovate. Are we ready? Yeah. Please. Okay. 
it's going to be one of those days. Um, but it, when we tested it, it was perfect. So we'll, we'll get there. Um, the paid media effort engaged 17.2 million drive market impressions. More than 88,000 people engaged with 144,000 pages of content on the visittulsa.com site through the course of the campaign. A 70% increase in traffic versus 2019. So that money drove the market share that kept us at that 30, 37%. It kept our economy, our tourism economy, from collapsing. Um, our TripAdvisor ads delivered 673,000 impressions with an open rate, or click-through rate as they call it, um, of 0.9%. And that doesn't sound like much, but the national average, the standard is 0.46. So it was double that. So we were really impressed with those numbers. There was pent-up demand. People wanted to travel, but they wanted to travel safely. And they were typically doing it in a drive market. So we really were the market that people could trust. And it was because of the messaging. It was because of the investment the county commissioners decided to share in that industry. And it saved a lot of businesses. Um, do we want to try and run that again? Yeah. All right. All right, we're going to work on that. I am so sorry, but again, it worked perfectly when we, um, when we ran it this afternoon. Um, so then on to the Tulsa County Recovery Film Program. Um, again, working with the county and making application, we received $137,000 in CARES funding to launch the Tulsa County Film Recovery Program. And again, if you don't know much about Tulsa's film program, we started seven years ago, and it's it's gone through the roof. And now with the new incentive at the state level, $30 million incentive, it's actually going even further through the roof. It's actually becoming a burgeoning industry in our community, and we're really excited about that. Um, the program had $90,000 in a fund for productions with COVID-related expenses. So we provide things like PPE, um, location coordinators to keep the location safe for all those crew and cast, and then also for the community. So our film crews went back to work safely and provided um, um, over 4,200 hotel room nights. We supported five productions through that program, including Sterling Harjo's Reservation Dogs, which you'll hear about here in a little bit. Um, 542 local crew jobs. So those people would have been on the unemployment rolls, but instead they were working films in our community. $17.5 million was spent in Tulsa in films during this time. Imagine that. We made $137,000 investment, and we got $17.5 million back. I think Kirk, as a banker, would make that investment. Uh, over and over and over again. So that's, again, proof and pudding that when you do the right things and when you invest in the right opportunities and right activities, it turns into revenue for our community. Um, and then we have another video. We're going to give it a go. We shot in Tulsa in July and August of 2019. We had an amazing experience. Really, the film couldn't have gone better. The Tulsa Film Office was really an incredible resource for us till the end of production and, and actually after. And from introducing us to vendors, to helping to find locations, to sending popsicles to sets, which were a huge hit. First of all, the number one thing is it was easy, easy, easy to facilitate getting the licensing and the permits to shoot on the street easy to locate the crew that is professional and at a Hollywood class level in their productions. This was my first opportunity to film in Tulsa and the experience was absolutely extraordinary. Between its urban landscapes, its suburban and rural areas and the surrounding towns, and even the natural landscapes, Tulsa gives you everything you need to paint the canvas you wish to make on film. It was a story that took place on the streets of Tulsa, and it needed to have that authenticity, that feeling. 
There is a timelessness to Tulsa and a slice of America preserved in the locations. This can't be replicated anywhere else. I am fairly new to the film scene here in Tulsa, but every project we've done so far has been just met with open arms from the cast and crew to locations, and everyone's been amazing to work with so far. The community is really supportive. Uh, neighborhoods, um, business owners, everyone's really supportive. We actually were trying to decide between shooting in Atlanta, Oklahoma City, or Tulsa. And Abby Curran and Ray Hoyt could not have been more helpful in that decision and actually instrumental in convincing us to shoot in Tulsa, which was the best decision we could have made. We were able to secure an incredible team across the board, making many of our hires local. Between their extraordinary access to locations and very simple permitting process, I found it to be one of the best places I've ever filmed. I'll keep coming back as long as they'll have me. them all back. We also launched a project to support Tulsa's thriving music ecosystem that was beginning that was being heavily impacted by the pandemic, as you can imagine. Play Tulsa Music was a $325,000 music program, recovery program funded again by the CARES program and the county commissioners. Can I say that enough? Um, this promo, thank you Karen, this promo was created by Trey Thaxton of Good Mill or Gold Mill Creative um, announced this program in September 2020. Tulsa's music scene is legendary. Pre COVID, our talented musicians could be found in one of our storied venues every night of the week from hip hop to jazz to rock, Americana, and classical. Tulsa's sound is as diverse as the city itself. We all miss live music, and now is the time to support our artists. Now, more than ever, we can't let the music stop. Introducing Play Tulsa Music, a music recovery effort where we are giving $150,000 to support Tulsa County venues in getting our local musicians back to work safely. Learn more at playtulsamusic.com. This program directly supported local artists in Tulsa, which was crucial during the pandemic. Many were unemployed. With funding from Tulsa County, we supported 26 venues uh, in the Tulsa County, helping to offset 700 plus live performances. Yes, live performances. Many were outside, but many were um, indoors with social distancing as the CDC and the health department required. Um, again, we featured local artists. This wasn't bringing people in. This was supporting our local musicians, our local artists. We also set out to relaunch the program this year and privately raised funding to continue Play Tulsa Music with $100,000 was awarded to 18 venues helping to create 600 live performances this year and it just actually finished two weeks ago. We'll celebrate 2021 at the next annual meeting. Um, and again, the cool thing is, is we've kept this music alive because guess where we're going to next year? We're going back to South by Southwest and who do we need? We need those musicians to be here and to go with us. Right? It's Tulsa's music scene. So it was critical for us to keep them engaged so they didn't move someplace else. And now they're here to celebrate with us next year and go to South by Southwest. So take a look at this feature video, lo, um, featuring video of two local musicians who were supported by Play Tulsa Music. The video was also produced by Gold, Gold Mill Creative. My name is Brand J. I'm Jordan Hale. I've been in Tulsa since 2008. I am blown away by Tulsa's music scene. My favorite venue. The Colony. A lot of my favorite musicians are up there. I love duet jazz. The intimacy and the closeness. Music has been one of the most important things to help me feel OK. And in order for it to happen, it needs support. Be safe. Continue to support local artists. Don't stop the music. Play Tulsa music. Yeah, great people. Uh, then we had the sales recovery program awarded $217,000. Again, sales recovery program provided to us by the uh, CARES Fund and the county commissioners provided tools needed to address the new digital needs of our audiences to get Tulsa's value and story to into the hands of planners um, and digitized. 
many people are not traveling and we need to get the message to them and get it to our audiences and get Tulsa's value and story in their hands uh, as they plan for the future events. And many of you know, we plan years in advance in our industry, but vacationers plan months ahead as well. We just needed to tell that story, make sure that people were thinking about Tulsa and not losing sight of the fact that we had all these things to offer. The program included developing market-specific sales videos and facility tours of videos to distribute remotely in place of hosting site visits and attending person in-person conferences and events. This gave us a leg up. Many of our industry partners put all that on a hold and we went ahead and forged ahead and created those videos and we've been using them since. They've become kind of a staple for us as well. This video is just one of the several marketing specific sales videos we created, again, with the CARES funds. It was productive, produced by Retrospect. Tulsa has a story and it's being told more and more. Have you been inspired by Tulsa yet? Tulsa is entrepreneurial, creative, vibrant, active, family friendly, and historic. Tulsa is consistently recognized in national rankings with recent ones like top nine most surprising cities, top five unexpected U.S. foodie destinations, home to the fourth best live music venue, home to the most important monument to visit in the U.S. And finally, Tulsa is the only American city on TripAdvisor's global emerging destinations list in 2020. Let our team at the Tulsa Convention and Visitors Bureau tell you Tulsa's story and showcase how Tulsa can inspire your next visit. In celebration of the great content promoting the work we've been doing, we're going to debut the 2021 Tulsa Regional Tourism Annual Recap Video. 2020 was a big year for Tulsa Regional Tourism with the help of Visit Tulsa, the Tulsa Convention and Visitors Bureau, the Tulsa Sports Commission, and the Tulsa Office of Film, Music, Arts, and Culture. Throughout the year, we hosted and booked 105 events, including the North American Ironman Championship, AKC 2021 National Agility Championship, and the Big 12 Wrestling Championships, all leading to a massive economic impact of over $227 million. We surpassed our hotel room night goal of 110,000 by 30%, booking over 143,000 rooms. And not to mention, we crushed our sales leads goal, setting out for 260 and hitting 295 leads. Film had a big year in Tulsa too. 41 productions filmed in the Tulsa area, including Killers of the Flower Moon and FX TV show Reservation Dogs. Tulsa area filmed Minari was nominated for six Academy Awards in 2021. The Film Recovery Program was awarded $137,000 in aid to various productions, creating more than 500 local film crew jobs and 4,200 plus room nights. When it comes to music, it's exploding in Tulsa. The music industry is growing four times faster than any other industry in town. In 2020, $190,000 went to Tulsa music venues to help hire local musicians for live performances. The Tulsa Music Strategy was released in 2021 and found that music has a $335 million impact on Tulsa's economy. We've proven Tulsa is the creative hub of Oklahoma. Tulsa Safely was awarded $565,000 to launch, uniting more than 200 local businesses to combat the spread of COVID-19 and generating 17.2 million market impressions. None of this would be possible without community support from our sponsors, investors, and local partners. You can bet Tulsa won't be slowing down anytime soon. Yeah, that's good. Um, thanks to Retrospect for creating this with us. We partner with uh, several of the, the production companies in town and we'll, we'll push this all year long because it's a great recap for us and we'll send it out to our partners um, and our stakeholders as well. We far surpassed our room goal night goal with more than 143,000 rooms in it, as you saw that there. Again, realize this, that we were 35% down in staff. And, and I think that's important to, to just Think about that in your businesses. You, many of you have businesses. Imagine losing, I, I use the Thanos, uh, uh, um, that's my pop culture reference, my young staff laugh at me, but imagine 35% of all the visitors, all of your staff being gone one day and you're supposed to carry on. You're supposed to deliver on the same business that you do every day, and we did. So I can't, I can't thank them enough. Um, 
in what we did and what we created um, and still kept our industry alive. And that's um, a testament, again, to their tenacity and to their, um, their passion for what they do and their passion for Tulsa. They still Tulsa. Just some goals, some highlights. We booked 54 events in the Cox Business Center. Woohoo! I know our, our friends are up there. 13 at the BOK Center and 15 at Mohawk Sports Complex. Again, in the middle of the pandemic. A sincere thank you to each of you for your support, investment, advocacy, and collaboration within our tourism industry in Tulsa. We are honored uh, to get to do what we do every day. Each of us um, at the, on the Tulsa Regional Tourism team, uh, like all of you in the audience, we are incredibly passionate about Tulsa and what we do every day. And we truly appreciate your support financially um, in your time, um, talent, and treasure. I know um, Kirk is, um, many of you are CEOs, and you come to board meetings, and you do financial calls, and you do all these things because you want to. Um, and, uh, and we doubled your pay you know, a couple of times from zero to times four, and, and you still show up every day uh, at these meetings. And I, again, your leadership is really important to us because you advocate for us in the community. And uh, without that advocacy and that support, I, I don't know where we would be. So um, we're going to do some awards now. You know, I could, if Kirk could join me up here. Um, this year we added three, we added new awards. We typically just have the Inspires Award and the Dan Harrison Andrade Award. But we felt like we were missing um, opportunities to celebrate people that support FMAC or sports or um, tourism. And so we've added those awards this year. So we'll go through these, but it's really an appreciation award of the, the excellence that you bring to our team. And um, we excel when we're pushed. And I think you as, um, as partners, you help us do that every day. Come on up, Kirk. I'll let you pass by here. In order. All right. So our first award is um, a commitment to passion and leadership for tourism in Tulsa. We established this award um, after Dan Harrison, a past board chair who passed away um, with cancer during his term, and it's an Entrada Award. Um, so we give it annually. I know Annie and, and uh, Mary Ann are here. If you want to come down, if you would, please. I know we always make them be involved, his wife and daughter. Um, Dan, was, Dan was one of those guys that would look at me and say, why are we doing that? And he wanted an explanation. He wanted a business explanation. And he made us better every day. Um, so um, Dan was one of those guys that um, was, was tough but also fair and uh, made us better. So the rip recipient of this award, and I apologize, he's not here. He's at a, a board meeting um, in California. His name is Mike Mears. He's our past chair. He's the CEO of Magellan. Like Kirk, he has a day job. Um, but Mike served two years as our chair and was tireless. Um, if you know Mike, he's a pragmatist. Everything for him is, is, a, is, a, is a cause and effect. And again, he just made us better as a chair. And uh, again, uh, he was one of those guys that would have coffee every Wednesday with me at 8 o'clock. And if everybody knows me, I'm not an early, early morning person. But I would get up and have coffee with Mike at 8 o'clock, much like I do with Kirk, because um, he wants to know the business, and he wanted to understand it. Um, and when he needed to advocate for us, he did. When he, his lobbyist needed to go to Oklahoma City and help us with legislation, Mike sent his lobbyist down to the, the, the turnpike to the Capitol. And again, his resources were um, ours and his knowledge and his experience and his wisdom was ours. So we want to thank Mike Mears, and Kirk is going to accept that award on his behalf. <laughs> now for um, Tulsa Inspires Award. Pardon me. This is given to someone. Pardon me. Um, I always get choked up about Dan, so. For bringing attention to Tulsa. This is the Inspires Award. 
Um, this award is a unique way um, in the 2021 recipient of this Tulsa Inspires Award goes to the Kraft family. Ryan and JW, if you don't know them, they truly are amazing. Um, about three years ago, we started talking to them about the USL Pro Club. And um, we knew that the owners, the Hubbards, were um, not going to continue running the USL team. And we knew to save that team and to keep pro soccer in Tulsa, that it was gonna take somebody from Tulsa um, to do that. And um, the Kraft family stepped up. Um, uh, we met with them a few times. Um, like everybody, they wanted to find out what it was about and the facts, and they did. And when, when it, they really kind of got passionate about it, they bought the club. And from day one, they did the things that you have to do when you own a professional club. They invested, um, they, got, they got knowledge base, um, and they started to understand soccer. They hired a great coach. They hired a great manager from Nashville and James Cannon, and James built a great team. And ever since then, it's been up. Um, they've made the playoffs last year. They're gonna make the playoffs again this year. I knock on wood. Um, and it's been a great um, uh, add to our community. And soccer is the fastest, one of the fastest growing sports in the world. And, and it's important um, to Tulsa to be a part of that scene in our sports scene. And they've been tireless um, about investing in that. And uh, they are, I think, is JW here? I know he was trying to stay. They were traveling this weekend. Um, and I probably had to travel with the team. So we're gonna accept this award on, on behalf of the Kraft family, JW and Ryan Kraft. Um, again, a thankful, um, community we should support that team just like we do all of our teams but they truly have become um, a great legacy family in Tulsa and they're supporting our sports and our pro sports industry so I talked about those three new awards so um, again it's I don't know if you can give away enough awards especially people who are so deserving and are so passionate about what we do so we're excited about these debuting tonight. Um, so the first um, award is a CVB specific award. Tulsa Convention Visitors Bureau awarded this excellence in events is awarded to the individual facility or group that surpasses expectations um, to provide visitors and events with a truly Tulsa welcome, making sure everyone leaves with the, fa with the lasting and amazing impression of our town. Just to give you an idea, our our ratings and our scores and surveys post event with our clients is it like something crazy, Patty, 90, 93, 93% of our clients give us that kind of rating, 93% rating on our, our post event scores. And that's not because of us, that's because of the community and because of our venues and our hosts. So we wanna honor that facility tonight. So tonight we present that award to Expo Square for doing everything they could to continue to make equine events happen throughout the past year, Tulsa Expo, uh, was saddled with responsibility and moved mountains to keep clients happy and safe. Accepting the award tonight is Mark Andrus, President and CEO at Expo Square, and Amanda Blair, Chief Operating Officer at Expo Square. Mark and Amanda. They are phenomenal partners. Sometimes we push them pretty far, but they always seem to, um, to make it work and um, exceptional. Thank you. Thank you. And if you ever want to hear some great stories about Expo Square, Mark's been there longer than I think the building. Um, just go pull up a chair in front of his office. He'll, he'll never let your coffee cup run empty and uh, he will uh, share his wisdom and stories with you. Thank you. Up next, the Tulsa Sports Commission Award named Champion of Sport. Recognize an individual or organization who has gone above and beyond to better Tulsa sports environment. The organization receiving this award tonight is ASM Tulsa for their outstanding perseverance, flexibility, and effort as they worked to meet the needs of major sports clients like Big 12 Wrestling, imagine that, in the middle of um, the pandemic, and we've got guys wrestling on a mat, and we're trying to figure out how do we do that safely. USA Wrestling Junior Duels, World of Wrestling, Youth National Duels, Reno Worlds, and American Cornhole Association. ASM wrestled, how do you like that? Wrestled with the challenges presented by the pandemic 
and, and came out on top. Accepting this award tonight are Joe Giordano, Assistant General Manager for the BOK Center, and Angie Teal, Assistant General Manager for the Cox Business Convention Center. Again, great partners. Um, they never said no, they just said let us, let us figure it out. And, and that's what partners do for each other. Finally, the Tulsa FMAC, Film, Music, Arts, and Culture Award. The Tulsa Creativity Award is for outstanding achievement, is awarded to an individual or group that demonstrates a high level of impact through the creative industries. And I don't know if you know Richard Florida, but he talks about the creative industries and it's alive and well because of FMAC and Abby Kern and all her work and all the people that do their, their creative um, work here. Uh, the individual receiving this inaugural award tonight uh, is the perfect example of creative impact, creativity and impact. From Sundance to Toronto International Film, uh, Toronto International Film Festival, this filmmaker continues to make authentic Oklahoma indigenous stories for the big and small screen. His recent project, Reservations Dog, Reservation Dogs, how many people have seen that? <laughs> Woohoo! Has been an international success on FX Hulu, filmed in and around Tulsa. This production hired more than 150 local crew. We were honored to work with his team throughout the production and support them with Tulsa County Film Recovery uh, Program funding. Thank you again, Tulsa County Commissioners. The Tulsa Creativity Award for Outstanding Achievement goes to Sterling Harjo. <laughs> now, thanks to technology, we hope. Sterling is here with us tonight, virtually, to accept his award. Sterling? Hi. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> Woo! Your, the audio kind of keeps cutting out. <clears throat> um, yeah, thank you very much for this award. Um, you know, it's always been important for me to shoot in Oklahoma. And specifically, you know, uh, I remember when I was working in, I lived in Austin and I was having coffee with um, uh, Robert Rodriguez's ex-wife now, but wife then uh, slash producer. And I was telling her about all of my films and scripts and things like that. And she was like, well, what are you doing here? in Austin. I was like, well, I don't know, because there's supposed to be some sort of film industry here. And I didn't want to go to LA. And she said, well, it sounds like you need to be in Oklahoma. Like that's where all of your projects take place. And she said, you know, Richard Linklater and Robert Rodriguez, uh, the only way that they were able to stay and work in Tulsa or in Austin was because they planted their feet there and they wouldn't leave. And they just did their work there. And really that was kind of some of the uh, inspiration that I needed to, you know, I quickly left and I moved to Tulsa. Uh, I had a lot of friends in Tulsa. Um, I hadn't lived there at the, that point, here at that point, but I was in, I lived in Norman and grew up in Holdenville, Oklahoma. And really just fell in love with Tulsa and knew that I wanted to make it a home and knew that I wanted to grow a art community and film community here and also bring light to the native uh, arts and community here. Um, I think that the celebration of native culture in for for this town is what is the thing that will make it unique and is the thing that will make people come here. Um, I also think that, um, you know, I was able to film here and it's, you know, Tulsa FMAC and everyone there has been very uh, supportive and, and helpful and you know, uh, they wanted me to shoot in New Mexico and I said, no, I want to shoot in Oklahoma. FX was amazing to work with and that they let me shoot in Oklahoma. Um, and Tulsa was such a great place to base out of. We shot some here. We stayed here. The whole crew stayed here. And it was really great to see, you know, just to see the impact that we made in both Tulsa and Old, and Old Mulgee. Um, so, you know, I'm busy right now writing season two, literally. <laughs> um, and we will see the crew will be here and all the locals that worked on the crew will be will be back and employed very soon and we'll be shooting season two in the spring so uh, very excited about that uh, thank you again for the award
Thank you so much, Sterling. Thank you. All right, so our keynote speaker tonight, um, I'm gonna not read his bio. He said don't read his bio. And I work for Reggie, so if he says don't do something, you typically don't do that. Um, Reggie is, a, a, I would tell you, he's an accomplished servant leader. I worked with him at Disney, um, at Disney Sports for five years, and he was um, uh, an amazing leader. Uh, his career um, has really started, I think, when he was a child in uh, Flint, Michigan, and um, uh, grew up through major adversity um, as a young black man and uh, overcame it every time. I don't think they build a wall that he can't climb over or knock down. Um, he, uh, his tenacity and passion for the, the little guy or the underdog or just doing the damn right thing. Um, sometimes it's hard to do, and he never um, shied away from that. And um, he's uh, accomplished probably more than most people would in a lifetime. So I would tell you he brought his, um, he was a Cincinnati Bengal for 15 years, started an Indies career there as a tenacious linebacker. Um, his, his point of intimidation was he went to his office and he had a picture of him sacking Joe Montana. And that was kind of, that's kind of uh, Reggie's style um, in the Super Bowl. And, um, but he brought that passion tenacity to Disney and I think that was important because um, I think Disney needed a leadership that was that passionate. Not that they weren't, but I think he brought a new style to them and a new um, kind of relevance to commitment. Um, and, um, and he's taken that through his whole life, whether he's a city councilor in Cincinnati or working for underprivileged youth. Um, he was a sportsman of the year. Uh, he and I went to ESPN um, um, awards one year together, which was an amazing experience. Um, but you always could count on Reggie. Uh, even when you were doing great things, he had your back. And when you sometimes didn't do great things and you, you had a miss, he still had your back. But he was always a servant leader. And uh, that's the most I appreciate about Reggie was a servant leader. Please help me welcome Reggie Williams. Thank you, Ray. <clears throat> How's everybody doing? Let me tell you, I used to start all of my uh, meetings at Disney. I would start off saying, failure. And everyone at Unision would say, it's not an option. <laughs> failure. It's not an option. There you go. You know, this is my third time here in Tulsa. I'm very, very thrilled to be here. The first time I came to Tulsa, I was doing my very first and only cross-country drive. And uh, I was going from LA back to Cincinnati and I passed through uh, Tulsa. I tell you what, it takes all day to drive through, uh, you know, Texas, Oklahoma, that whole expanse. But when I came through Tulsa on, on some uh, off ramp, we were smelling something so good, it was a sort of pull in and it was a smoker with the best meat I've ever eaten. <laughs> and so I, I was really happy to come back here. And then in 1987, I was uh, fortunate to receive from the United States JCs uh, one of the 10 outsta outstanding young Americans for community service. And that was in 1987. And at that point in time, I really thought my NFL career was almost over. Uh, in 1987, I had an operation uh, that was basically a last disc effort to try to save uh, my right leg. And um, I had what was called a microfracture surgery now, but it was just called an abrasion then. And uh, that operation was supposed to give me maybe, you know, one more year to play, and I ended up playing three years on that particular leg. And I want to tell you how important that was for me and how I ended up, uh, you know, putting my life's experiences into a book called Resilient by Nature. And it was a collaboration with Jared Bell, who was a USA Today um, uh, writer for the NFL. And the forward is written by Seattle Seahawks quarterback Russell Wilson, whose father, Harry B. Wilson, was one of my best friends in college. And I was myself born and raised in Flint, Michigan. Now, how did I end up in Flint, Michigan? My father is from Birmingham, Alabama. 
And so one of the really great things that I uh, had an opportunity to do today was go to the Greenwood Rising Project. Just so phenomenal, so tragic history that we all have to live up to. Well, my father had that same kind of history in Birmingham, Alabama. At age 16, he was a good enough baseball player that he had a tryout with the Birmingham Black Barons. In fact, one of his teammates was Willie Mays. And uh, he also uh, did some work um, with uh, construction. And it's one that, during that construction job, that he got into a fight with his white boss. He hit his white boss. And that night, he and all my uncles, his brothers, all had to leave Birmingham that day. And they went as far north as they could go without going to Canada. And that ended up in Flint, Michigan. And a few years later, I was born. And I was born to my mom, who is Puerto Rican. So I was really at the very bottom of the ladder to success in America. Born in 1954, the year of the Brown versus Board of Education decision, which basically said that unequal schooling was unconstitutional. And not only am I black, I'm half Puerto Rican and poor. On top of all that, I was born hearing impaired. If you can't hear sounds, it's impossible for you to repeat sounds. So I developed a real bad stutter and a lisp. And the real fortunate thing about being raised in Flint, Michigan is that uh, Michigan School for the Deaf is in Flint, Michigan. In fact, it, it was called at that time Michigan School for the Deaf and Dumb, which created such a stigma for me and anyone who was uh, dealing with that challenge. But I followed my parents' advice that through education, I could accomplish everything, anything. And so I basically was academically focused. Uh, I wanted to be a doctor in homage to the speech therapists and doctors that really helped me overcome so much adversity. And I was going to the University of Michigan. That's where my dream was my whole entire life. And I was a decent football player, not a, the greatest football player. I didn't make any all-star teams in high school, but I was starter on my high school team, which is an 8-1 and one, eight and one team. I was also a good wrestler and uh, felt that, uh, you know, with a full academic ride, uh, uh, I could make the University of Michigan team. Well, Bo Schimbeckler, who was my hero at that time, he was the head coach of Michigan. He came to my high school, came up to me and said, Reggie, if you decide to come to the University of Michigan, do me a favor, don't come out for my team. You're just not good enough. Talk about crushing a young person's dream. I went home, you know, almost tearful, telling my father that, you know, my former idol, Bo Schimbeckler, had told me that I wasn't good enough to be a Wolverine. And uh, my father said, you know, forget about Bo. You know, education is still the key to success. Uh, you got into Dartmouth College. I'm going to get an extra job so that I can afford to send you to college as well as send my older brother to college. And so that's how I ended up at Dartmouth College, and I had such a chip on my shoulder. And the first time that I was at practice, um, there were some white guys who didn't want to have black teammates, didn't want to shower with black players. They had come from a very insulated environment. Well, my freshman coach, Jerry, Jerry Burnt, he found out about that. And you know what he did? He made me the captain of the team on the very first day. I'd never been captain of anything. And all of a sudden, I'm captain of the freshman football team. To, and that was the purpose, was to teach these guys a lesson. Well, what I did with that vote of confidence, I became one of the best linebackers in Ivy League history. I was so determined to prove him right and to prove Bo Schimbeckler wrong that I became the only African-American, all-American 
in the Ivy League since the Ivy League was formed in 1954. And I thought by then I'm really good enough. Maybe I'll have a chance to play in the NFL. And I was invited to the Hula Bowl, which I was excited to perform at. But when I got to the Hula Bowl, the defensive coordinator, George Hill from Ohio State, he really had negative feelings about Ivy Leaguers. And even though I was an All-American, he benched me. He put me on the bench and he made fun of me every practice. And in the game, the only time I was ever on TV, he only played me one play. And I was so embarrassed that I was ready to quit football. And on the flight back from uh, the Hula Bowl, I have a layover in Cleveland. And I'm just really sad about the fact that, you know, I've lost all this confidence in myself. And who do I see walking down the aisle? Muhammad Ali. And I said, wow, there's a sign here. And I walked up to Muhammad Ali, and I introduced myself. And I told him what I was going through, and I told him how much of a hero he was to me. And he told me to believe in myself, to pursue my dreams, that you become a hero to yourself when you believe in yourself. And with his vote of confidence, I decided to continue to pursue the opportunity to play professional football. A few months later, I was drafted by the Cincinnati Bengals in the third round. I was actually drafted by the Toronto Argonauts in the Canadian Football League in the first round. But, you know, going to Canadian Football League would have been identity suicide. You know, no one really knows about Canadian football. And even though I was offered one-tenth as much salary to play for the Cincinnati Bengals as I would have made for Toronto, my heart and passion was playing in the NFL because I wanted to be a champion, a Super Bowl champion. And in my 14-year career, I had two opportunities. Super Bowl 16 was uh, my first opportunity. In order to get to Super Bowl 16, we had to play in the coldest game in NFL history, minus 59 degrees below zero wind chill. And the whole theme of my presentation here is turning a negative into a positive. Okay? And so on that particular day, I played the game bare-armed. So did our offensive line. And now when you see, you know, cold weather games, there hasn't been one that's cold, you know, guys are now out there, you know, sleeveless, you know, sun's out, guns out, you know, everyone's showing off. But it all started with that game. We lost three fans in that game. Three fans who got drunk, got hypothermia, and they took off their jackets. And it's a tragedy. You know, I love our fans. To think that a person would pass away supporting you in the stadium was something that made the game even that much more momentum. And on top of that, the first and only time that high school teammates were playing against each other was in Super Bowl 16. The starting running back for the San Francisco 49ers was Ricky Patton. He was my high school teammate at Flint Southwestern. He was a running back and I was a linebacker. And here we are in the biggest games of our career and only one of us is going to go home a champion. And in that game, it was him. And I remember when we arrived back in Cincinnati and we're taking the drive um, to go to our locker room to, at the stadium, all of a sudden all the cars would stop and they saw our buses and people would get out and it was still cold, it was still below zero wind chill. And people just waved at us. We had such great fans. And we changed our plan to go down to uh, Fountain Square so that we could talk to 10,000 fans who had gathered. And we promised them that we were going to win a Super Bowl. But the next year, we didn't. And it took seven years before we got back to Super Bowl 23. And the reason that I was here in Tulsa in 1987 was because of community service. And after the 87 season, 
which was a strike season. I was the Walter Payton NFL Man of the Year, and I crossed the picket line. I didn't think that an NFL Man of the Year should strike the NFL. And so I continued to play, creating a lot of animosity with some of my teammates. And we had a horrible 4-11 and 11 season. But during the offseason, I was appointed to Cincinnati City Council. I had a further incentive to not only play for my teammates, but now for every single citizen that's in the city of Cincinnati. And we stormed all the way to the final 35 seconds of Super Bowl 23. We're leading the San Francisco 49ers when all of a sudden Joe Montana sends a pass to John Taylor to seal the game. And the thing that was so painful for me, I was having one of the best games of my career. I was determined that we were going to take a Super Bowl championship home to Cincinnati. But in those last five games, five plays of that game, our defensive coordinator called a defense that put me on the bench. And I watched the nightmare unfold from the bench, all the time thinking that if I'm in the game, I'm going to make a play. But I never got back in the game, and we lost. And that is what befell me by the time that I was being hired by Disney. I was tired of failure. I had been in the World League of American Football after I retired. I was general manager, thinking that if I do well enough in the World League of American Football, that uh, the Cincinnati Bengals will hire me as their general manager. But the NFL canceled the World League of American Football after just two years. And I'm fired for the first time and out of a job for about an hour. And the reason is because the NFL had a problem. That was the year of Super Bowl 27. They asked me to take the position as director of community relations for Super Bowl 27. That year is most notable uh, for the halftime show. That was Michael Jackson's halftime show. And uh, in that particular, that was also the year following the Rodney King riots. And so I was tasked with coming up with a program on behalf of the NFL that would show that the NFL cared. And I came up with NFL Youth Education Town. And that was a multifaceted education and athletic facility for the most at-risk kids in South Central LA. In order to open this up, I had to negotiate a truce between the Bloods and the Crips. And the reason is you couldn't let one of them tag your facility because it would create a gang war. In order to negotiate with the Bloods and the Crips, you can't know where they are. So they picked me up at my hotel, blindfolded me, frisked me, put me in the back seat under a gun, and took me to a place I have no idea was. And when they walked me downstairs, still blindfolded, when they unblindfolded me, I'm in a basement full of murderers. And yet, these individuals had such passion for their little brothers and sisters, for their children, that they wanted a better, a different life in the future. And they saw NFL Youth Education Town as a benefit. And so they agreed to a truce. It was right in that time that I was going to Disney for sponsorship. One of my Dartmouth classmates, Michael Montgomery, was the treasurer. And that's when Michael Eisner, the chairman of the company, came over to our table because I was the sole All-American from Dartmouth. He knew who I was because his two sons went to Dartmouth and they played hockey at Dartmouth. And so I guess as a gift, once they graduated, he bought them the Mighty Ducks. <laughs> Do we have parents like that? Must be great. Well, he came over to my table 
And uh, he asked me, you know, we bought the Mighty Ducks. We're passionate about sports. We have all this land at Walt Disney World. What would you do? Just like that. And I answered him, the first thing was we should do a marathon where you can go to every single park and you see how big the property is and all the other beautiful things that you can find at Walt Disney World. Then I basically described the sports facilities we had at Dartmouth because they were so plentiful and they were so first class. And then I described what uh, I experienced in Flint, Michigan. In Flint, we all played at this central stadium called Atwood Stadium. There were four major high schools. And so basically, we met at one place to compete. And so my idea was we should have one place somewhere in America where the four corners of America come to compete. And the greatest thing about this is that all of this would be authentic. It would be so authentic that I wouldn't even let Mickey Mouse in the complex. Mickey or Goofy or anyone else, none of those characters, because I wanted the kids to be the heroes. And the kids were the heroes, and they were the stars of the show. And so when we started Disney's Wide World of Sports, we had been turned down six times for the business because there are so many other competing, but we're tenacious. And we kept saying, even though we get turned down in my meeting, failure is not an option because we weren't going to fail. And we were going to support these kids who are fighting for their dreams, fighting for their championships, fighting for a successful conclusion to all of their sweat and tears. And that's what Wide World of Sports was going to provide them, the opportunity to be the best, to be a champion. But you know what? If for some reason they lost, they were still at Walt Disney World, the happiest place on earth. And that's someplace I wasn't when I lost two Super Bowls. And so that's really why I want to sort of tell you about the importance of perseverance. Because of my pursuit of trying to be a champion, I've had 27 knee operations. I've had four knee replacements here. I was born bow-legged. So I had to get a knee replacement my left knee because if you have a prosthetic, it's straight. And so you can't have a crooked leg and a straight prosthetic. And so this leg right now is concrete. It doesn't move. But fortunately, when I was in college, and one of the things that propelled me my NFL career is that I took ballet. And I have great flexibility. How many of you could do that? <laughs> I've also had an aorta dissection, open heart surgery. I had less than 24 hours to live. And you have to believe in your doctors. And then, about nine months later, I had a stroke. And my right leg and my right arm could not move, and I could not talk. And fortunately, I got to the hospital just in time to get the clot buster, and I was assured that everything would be OK. But the next morning, it wasn't. My arm. And my leg were okay, but I couldn't speak. I could mentally articulate my son's phone number or my social security number or my name. But when, that, when I talked, it came out as, as gibberish. And so I was so, so frustrated. It was so scary. It was like Parkinson's degree. The, disease or, or Lou Gehrig's disease or something where you are mentally trapped inside of a body. And just as I'm about to really go into a deeper and deeper depression, I remember the words of Invictus. And I want to leave you with the words of Invictus, because I've tried to live 
an Invictus life, a life where you deal with adversity, but you overcome. So Invictus was written by William Ernest Henley when he was contemplating the loss of his leg. And as I say for all of us who are overcoming the pandemic, overcoming personal adversity with your health or with your family, I would ask you all to listen to these words of Invictus by William Ernest Henley. Out of the night that covers me, black as the pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. In the fell clutch of circumstance, I have not winced nor cried aloud. Under the bloody of chance, my head is bloody but unbowed. Beyond this place of wrath and tears looms but the horror of the shade, and yet the menace of the years finds and shall find me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. Thank you very much, Tulsa. Man. We're going to bring him in once a year and just talk to the team. <laughs> Is that all right, Reggie? A um, couple of quick things. Um, we're going to do a Q&A with Reggie um, for you all that have those questions. Um, also, I want to make sure, I um, mean, closing, that um, I left a couple of people on the staff. We talked about all of our new people, and we're so small and mighty. I want to make sure that I uh, mentioned Leah Davis. Um, I call her my assistant, but she really assists the entire team. So I know she's back there, and she's been helping us. Um, and Matt Stockman, who's been running around here, um, he's a, he's a one-man show, but he's really about six people. Um, um, the work he does is about six people, and probably the nicest guy you'll ever meet. And then I, I, I call her really, she's, she's um, the incomparable Kathleen Bournier. She has survived, she survived at least two or three, I think, uh, pandemics, economic turndowns, um, and she's never missed a goal in the 11 years I've been here. And um, yeah, um, she, she, she um, you know, she's just a, you know, she's just a sales killer. I mean, I, I don't care what we put her on, what she has to do, she just shows up later and like, here's my goal, here's my number and done. Uh, but she's an amazing individual and she's really kind of the stalwart of our, our entire team. So we want to do real quick, have Reggie back up here and ask some questions of Reggie. Um, and I know um, um, some of you may have to go, but we'd like to do that um, uh, if you'd like to do that with us. So Reggie, if you want to come back up. And I'm so proud of you for continuing to persevere, you know? <laughs> no, no quit on this team. So Reggie, I'm going to start. So as you started to, it was a big culture change for you when you got to Disney and for Disney with you. Talk to us about that as an executive that was really trying to change some, some um, things at Disney that saw that were great, but maybe they weren't so great. Yeah, when I was first hired by Walt Disney World, I was the very first African-American executive that was hired. And this is in 1993. And uh, when I went to the desk to pick up my ID, my ID was supposed to have a gold stripe on it. And this was shown to me by the vice president of, of human relations. He said, and you're going to get this ID. It's going to have this gold stripe. And you know, it shows that you're an executive. And you'll be able to park at all these special places, et cetera, et cetera. But when I went and said, hey, Reggie Williams, she saw that I was black. And the manager behind the desk said, no, 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 no. We know you must have the wrong job. And so she had to go and get her supervisor, and that supervisor didn't believe that I was being hired. So I had to run out to my car in a hot, hot summer of Florida and get my paperwork, and I went in, and they still said, well, we're gonna have to take it to our supervisor. So then I went into uh, the film called Traditions. This is the film that every single cast member, which is what 
the employees of Walt Disney uh, Company are called the cast members. Um, uh, every single cast member had seen this film. And this film basically was, you know, Walt Dix Disney talking about uh, what drove him to really create, you know, the brand. And the big star of the film was uh, Mickey Mouse. And the first time that he had a chance to speak uh, and sing was in um, Steamboat Willie. And so uh, the very first time that uh, sound was used with uh, live action was Al Jolson singing Mammy in blackface. And so in this tradition film, they had Al Jolson singing Mammy in blackface. Well, I thought that was offensive. And uh, I went to the manager and expressed my sentiments. Uh, she didn't agree. And so they basically pushed back on it, thinking that I'm being a rabble rouser. And they said, well, we're going to form this, this group to really evaluate you. And while I'm saying, OK, I'm being judged again, um, that was the year that Whoopi Goldberg took Ted Danson to the Hasty Pudding Awards at Harvard. And he went in blackface. And he just got so much negativity, appropriately, that all of a sudden, the people at Disney realized, wait a minute, he's doing us a favor. He's trying to point out what things we need to know about ourselves. And so Walt Disney then formed a, Walt Disney World formed a diversity department so that they could look at themselves in the mirror, essentially. And so every division then started taking a look in themselves. And in my opinion, that is one of the biggest fulcrums to why the Disney company is now the worldwide leader, because they look at themselves and they look at how they can profit from looking at themselves. You know, when we started the sports business in 1993, there were only two sports complexes in the country that weren't associated with a, with a uh, college campus or associated with the Olympics. There was a a real big soccer facility in many, uh, Minnesota. And then IMG in Bradenton had a, a track and a tennis facility. But we were innovative at Wide World of Sports when we said we could build a sports complex for business, where you're going to drive the incrementality of your visitation. You can choose the time of year when you need the business, you can create the business with sports events. And so they basically gave us all of the Disney bad weekends and said, make money. <laughs> and that's when we turned to great people like Ray and Trisha, who married Ray and other great cast members who have now are leaders in their own right in the industry. But we were the pioneers to show how you can drive incremental um, uh, room nights. You can drive incremental for at least Disney theme park ticket purchases, mer uh, merchandise purchases, food and beverage purchases, sponsorship because you now are driving a new incremental audience, an audience that loves sports more than they love theme parks. And so that was the key to our business. And, uh, and it's good to put it all in the rear view mirror from a personal standpoint. But we're looking in the front uh, window of success with they're doing here in Tulsa, what they're doing in several other cities across the country. So I'm very, very proud of, of all of the great leaders that have come out of uh, Disney sports. And they're all over the country. Thank you, Reggie. So I'm going <clears> to <throat> toss you a tough question. We talked a little about the other night. Disney um, Sports Complex hosted many NFL activities. And we had some news this week um, with a coach. And um, I know um, your experience with the NFL has been good and bad. You've had struggles with them. So in this world of kind of um, social correctness and, and um, calling people to task, um, how do you feel about some of the activities this week with somebody that you knew well? We're talking John Gruden. <laughs> Chucky. Um, 
when he was hired by the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, and it, you know, what people don't realize, he was traded to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers for a couple, a first round draft choice, a second round draft choice, I think a couple million bucks. He was drafted, he was traded during the off season. I had created the um, training camp for Tony Dungy, who was the coach. And I did it, you know, um, uh, understanding what kind of talent he had and the kinds of things that we had when I was running uh, general manager of the World League of American Football, the New York, New Jersey Knights. Well, all of a sudden they, they hired John Gruden and, uh, you know, he has, to con he has to follow our contract and for the very first uh, preseason. Well, that very first preseason training camp, they went and won the Super Bowl. John Gruden thanked us by changing everything about the training camp. Now, you know how frustrating that is, you know? It's, man, we just won you a Super Bowl. You know, if you do the same things we did last and maybe do them better, you might win two. Instead, he got released a few years later and, you know, you're learning now about how he thought. And, you know, I, I got to believe that one of the things he thought is that he was smarter than this black guy. You know, that's the one thing that has sort of come out in the revelation with his emails is that, you know, he's, he's pretty self-confident about himself. And he puts everyone else, women, he puts people of color down. So I think it's been a, uh, a, a learning lesson for everyone. Probably the biggest uh, culprit and who I did write, uh, uh, you know, negative about was Roger Goodell. He's the leader. You know, he has a, a, a rule, the, the Rooney rule, which is supposed to necessitate that uh, there is fairness in the hiring process, that uh, everyone of a color is going to get an opportunity for every job. And... Um, the Raiders didn't do that. And they went after John Gruden, and then um, they just forgot about the, the Rooney rule. So Roger Goodell, you know, basically uh, could have been a stronger leader on this subject matter. And the fact that he wasn't, this whole issue blew up in his face, and it's unfortunate. Um, I was uh, one of the candidates to be commissioner of the National Football League. I was uh, in the final four candidates. And um, unfortunately, that was when I had my uh, uh, knee replacement that resulted in osteomyelitis, which is an infection of the bone. And so that's why in saving my leg, I still lost, you can still see, I still lost three inches of my length. Uh, osteomyelitis is like termites. They, they constantly gnawing. You, you can feel and heat them. It's, it's, it was a horrible year, so to speak. But that is why I couldn't interview uh, during the time frame that they were uh, choosing uh, the, the best candidate for NFL commissioner. And uh, on that particular uh, issue, I knew, know that I would have done a better job than Roger Goodell. Thanks, Reggie. Questions out there, anybody? Thank you, Reggie. Uh, Tulsa is very proud of Greenwood Rising. Uh, it's only been open, I don't know, 60 days. Uh, what were your takeaways from it today? A very passionate leader, Phil. You know, uh, they need to replicate him. And uh, uh, very passionate. You know, obviously, um, my boss at Disney uh, I think he was born in Bartlesville, and uh, his name is Lee Cockrell. He's one of the best bosses I've ever had. Um, he knew so much about so many things, but he had never heard of the Tulsa riots. And I had a chance, I was the first one to tell him about the Tulsa riots, uh, because I had studied it when I came here uh, to receive uh, the 10 Outstanding uh, Young Americans Award. And uh, while I was on Cincinnati City Council, um, that was one of the 
um, stories that uh, I was informed of by my cabinet. I had a cabinet in Cincinnati that tried to uh, be a force uh, on civil rights. Uh, at the time I was elected to city council, I was the only African American on city council. And uh, one of the people in my little kitchen cabinet was a guy named Fred, Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth. And he marched with uh, Martin Luther King and others, but he had a church in Cincinnati. And he's the one that encouraged me to get involved along with Arthur Ashe with efforts to um, uh, divest business in South Africa. Um, and so when I say of the time that I spent in Cincinnati, the 15 years losing two Super Bowls, the only thing that made it worthwhile was the fact that I was successful in getting our city council to divest and doing any business in South Africa, come to find out that that really was the only financial link left in South Africa because of the huge uh, German population in Cincinnati. Uh, that Archbishop Desmond Tutu flew to Cincinnati to say that was the, uh, the straw that broke the camel's back and that Nelson Mandela would be getting out of prison and they were about to have their first democratic election in 1994. Well, you know, you would almost be happy to lose two Super Bowls for something like that, okay? But I didn't. You know, it's about, you know, the good. So what I saw with Greenwood Rising is they're trying to turn one of the most negative, abhorrent um, acts in American history into a positive. And that's a commendable thing because, you know, um, there was so much hate at that time. The only thing that can heal hate is love. And so this uh, project hopefully will make Tulsa an even more loving community. And in that respect, so I'm, I'm very much inspired and will, as I told Phil, I'm going to uh, try to help uh, support uh, the growth. I'm going to go to the National Football Foundation, which uh, also uh, supports the College uh, Football Hall of Fame, which I'm a member of. And because you have such a strong uh, association with Oklahoma, University of Oklahoma, and Oklahoma State, uh, and obviously there, there just seems to be an opportunity for them to really support uh, Greenwood Wine. So we'll see where it goes, but uh, um, I think uh, everyone here in Tulsa should be very proud that this is in their community. And they're telling, trying to turn one of the, uh, the most negative chapters in their uh, passed into one of the most positive chapters in their future. Very cool. Any other questions? All right, I'm going to finish one more question, Reggie. Talk to us, and it was in your book. If you haven't seen Reggie's book, Resilient by Nature, talk to us about Boomer Esiason and your relationship with, with Boomer. I'm going to keep this positive. <laughs> uh, you know, obviously, Boomer's a big star now. Uh, Chris Collins is a big star now. Um, back in 1987, uh, Boomer was the player's rep, and the assistant player's rep was Chris Collinsworth. So when I cross the picket line, I'm crossing those two guys. And um, <clears throat> I had uh, some uh, of my uh, defensive teammates who said, man, we'll cross with you, Rich. And I said, no, no, man, you know, it's already gotten personal, you know. Uh, you know, I'll handle this, you know, and, um, and so um, everyone didn't believe that we were able to come together in 1988, and that's one of the things that really is uh, amazing. I mean, it, it was uh, the 87 season, like I said, we, uh, we were 4 and 11. We lost one game against the San Francisco 49ers when we were leading by four points with six seconds to go on the clock, and we had the ball, and we lost that game. So uh, that was a year essentially where bygones have been bygones. Uh, I tell you, um, uh, Boomer has done a great job with his charity. Uh, he had uh, one of uh, his uh, 
kids. Uh, Xander was born with cystic fibrosis, and he has uh, really uh, supported a, uh, a foundation that has brought a lot of change and, and benefit uh, to that disease. It's all out of uh, Cincinnati Children's Hospital, so you know, uh, big kudos to Boomer and uh, things that he's he's doing to bring positiveness to uh, children in the next generation. Thank you, Reggie. So we're going to wrap it up for tonight, but I, I will tell you, doing the right thing sometimes is hard to do, but this guy's never, ever um, neglected that responsibility uh, or that duty um, in his soul. So thank, thank you, you right. Reggie. Thank you. thank you, everybody, for being here. And um, again, scan your QR code um, and pick up your, um, you can get your our, our annual report and our statistics and data on that QR code. Again, really appreciate you all being here tonight. Have a great evening, and uh, we'll see you soon.